This evening we're going to just read a passage of Scripture briefly in 2 Peter 3, verses 14 through 18. And again, remembering that uh, this series is a topical series, so uh, we're not going to be focusing just on this text, but we're going to begin here to uh, see again the importance of, of what we've been already looking at this evening, the importance of truth and that we hold on to that truth. 2 Peter 3, verses 14 through 18. We begin by reading verse 14. Peter writes, Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the scriptures, to their own destruction. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. You know, it is interesting in the context, Peter here is talking about the second coming of Christ and how his coming is going to bring about the renovation of the material universe. The old heavens and the old earth are going to burn up and the new heavens and the new earth are going to come. And he says, since you look for these things, you need to be diligent to be found in him on that day. In order to do that, I think it's clear, Peter is saying, we must know the truth. We must believe the truth. We must certainly live according to that truth. So he exhorts his readers to that end. And you know, of course, when, uh, when Peter is exhorting or Paul is exhorting a particular church and giving to them these, these commandments or these uh, directions, that the Lord intended those things not just for the church of that day, but for the church of all time. In other words, he intended us in that audience as well. So every believer from that time forward is to pay attention to what the Lord, of course, says, to that which is most important in order to eventually reach that paradise. I mean, the one overarching goal in the Christian life is that in the end, we are found in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we have peace with God, that we are clothed with his spotless righteousness that we are cleansed from all of our sins. And I think we can agree, of course, that is the most important. Of course, all of God's truth is important, but especially this. Now, this morning, we saw, of course, how we can do that through the gospel. Again, I just want to remind you what we saw this morning. There is only one gospel. There is only one way of salvation, and that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. He has provided only one way. And so if you are to see that paradise, you have to trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, for the righteousness alone that God will accept. You have to trust him and turn from your sins and obey him. And of course, that evidence that you are the Lord's must also be there. And it will be there in every true believer. And that is, of course, the, the evidence of a life that is growing more into the image of Jesus Christ that we are growing more in love with God, more in love with his people, more in love with his ways, even as our Lord Jesus Christ had a perfect love for those things. And again, this only comes through the gospel. You need to hear and understand it. Now, Peter reminds us this evening that the gospel that you hear has to be the true gospel. Now, in his day, sadly, there were many who distorted the truth. He, he does uh, talk specifically about the writings of, of uh, Paul. And I do want you to see here that uh, he, he not only says that they're distorting what Paul wrote, but he says they also do that with the rest of the scriptures. 
reminding us that what Paul wrote to us is the Word of God. Same thing is true with what Peter has written. And actually, in the context, he seems to be referring to the things that Paul wrote regarding the things that Peter was writing about, and that is the second coming of Christ and so forth. I mean, Paul did say that there are those who are saying that Jesus has already come, and they're upsetting the, the faith of some. And he seems to indicate that such an error is a very serious error. Again, there is a hierarchy of value on truths, and it's most important that we embrace those that are absolutely essential to our salvation. Well, what was true in, in Peter's day, we might say is true in spades today. We have many more false teachers than they did. Many false teachers have gone into the world equipped with false gospels, and so, like them, we need to beware. Now, what I want us to consider this evening is why we should value the truth. And I want us to look at it in, in two areas. I want us to see, first of all, the gospel, how important it is that we believe the gospel and that we not only value those truths, but, of course, we embrace them with our whole heart and live according to them. But also, how important it is to embrace everything the Bible says to try as much as is humanly possible to know what God says and to live according to that truth. And that, of course, for our well-being, for the glory of God, and for the well-being of others who are going to be affected by our view of the Scriptures. We do affect other people. Now, first of all, let's consider the gospel more narrowly. That is, uh, the, the message, the good news of what God has done to save sinners through Jesus Christ. I don't want to spend a great deal of time on this because I know that we're already fairly familiar with it and its importance. But again, I think you understand why it is of utmost importance that we preserve the truth of the gospel as we've already seen this evening and especially as we saw this morning. Without the gospel, we are lost. Without the gospel, we will perish. We will be condemned to hell forever for our sins. The gospel is the only way out. And of course, the gospel is also the only way out for anyone we would hope to lead to Christ. We need to know the truth. Now, the gospel, as you know, is a collection of certain truths that the Bible teaches. Thankfully, those truths are revealed so clearly in Scripture that there's really no question about what they are. Let me just, again, remind you, and, and I've been going through, I go through this, of course, in the, the new members class, and it's, it's absolutely essential to every one of us that we believe these things. Sometimes it's surprising how people can be in churches for years and hear these things and still not have a clue as to what they are. I ran into an individual years ago who was struggling with the assurance of his salvation. He had been in a, a church that was in this denomination. He had been examined for membership. He had been a member of that church for five years, and he had left that church and had been out of it for six years, and he had really no understanding of the gospel at all. Uh, for instance, he did not understand that God is triune. He thought he was just one person. He didn't know that Jesus Christ was God and man. He thought that he was simply a man. And he thought that the way of salvation was simply doing what God calls you to do and working your way to heaven, all of which are wrong. And you can't be saved believing those things. You have to believe in the triune God to have the true God. You have to believe in the Jesus who is God and man in order to have the true Jesus Christ, the one who was born of the virgin, the one who, was, who lived a perfect life according to the will of God to earn for us a perfect righteousness, and the one who died on the cross in order to atone for our sins. We have to believe in the right way of salvation. It can't be through our works. It must be through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone. We have to get the gospel right. And of course, we can't forget uh, that it's essential that having trusted Jesus Christ that our lives change. There has to be a change. We cannot go away the same people we were when we came to Jesus Christ. We have to be growing into His image. We have to have that supernatural love. We have to be 
born again of the Spirit, as Jesus said to Nicodemus, that new birth will produce a change in our lives. We will be growing into the likeness of Jesus Christ, which is, again, the likeness of perfect love. Those things must be true. We must believe the truth. We must uh, have that evidence that we have been saved if we are to actually arrive in heaven. Now, the only other thing we might add, of course, to these fundamental truths of the gospel is the fact that the Bible is the Word of God, because if you don't believe that, you have no basis upon which to believe anything regarding what God has said about the gospel. We have to believe the Bible is the Word of God. Now, you need to not only believe these things, but you actually have to trust Jesus Christ to save you from your sins. Now, again, remember, if you reject any one of these things. These are the foundational truths. These are the basic truths. This is the gospel. If you reject any of these things, then you will be lost. If you reject the Trinity or deny the two natures of Christ, which is what the Jehovah's Witnesses do, you will be lost. If you believe that, that God is, is one among many gods, as the Mormons believe, or you reject the Bible as the only source of authority, again, as Mormons and, well, Mormons believe, then you can't be saved. If you believe that the Bible is full of errors or that it becomes the Word of God to you as it sort of strikes you, as neo-Orthodox believes, neo-Orthodoxy, you won't be saved. If you believed, again, that you're saved by your works, rather than through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, as the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, and even some Arminians believe, such as Charles Finney, sadly. Or if you believe that you are saved by your baptism, as the Church of Christ teaches, or if you deny the virgin birth, as the liberals deny, you can't be saved. These things are foundational. You can't be saved by believing in another God or by trusting another Christ or by trying to come to God in another way than the way that He has actually given us in Scripture. You must believe the truth to be saved. Now certainly, I don't think there's any dispute about that. I just hope we all agree on what those foundational principles are that we need to hold on to ourselves, not only for our well-being and for the glory of God. It has to be by grace through faith alone in the true God if we are to honor Him because He is the one who has done it all and he offers it to us as a free gift. But it's also important for the well-being of others as we seek to bring the gospel to them. Because if we bring to them a gospel that is different than the one, as Paul said, that he brought to the Galatian church, then not only are we accursed, but we're also going to lead others down that same path. We want to make sure that we get these things right. Now again, I think we all understand that. I think we know that that is important, but I just want to remind us this evening as well that it may not be equally as important, but it certainly is important that we get the rest of the Bible right as well. I mean, the gospel are those foundational truths that, that God gives to us in his word that we have to believe in order to be saved, but you know as well as I do that we differ from a number of denominations and just about every church and every person within every church differs among themselves as to what they believe. That doesn't mean they're not Christians, of course. If they're believing the things we just saw and trusting Jesus Christ, they are Christians, they are brethren, and we should embrace them as such. But still, it does matter what we believe regarding other things. The gospel is not the only thing that we need to be concerned about. Now, let's think about this for a minute. I mean, why is it that God took such great care in communicating his word so that each and every word in scripture would be exactly the word that he wanted there. You realize we talk about the Bible, the fact that it's, it's inspired by God, it's God breathed, that is referring to the scriptures. That it is inerrant, there are no errors in the Bible, that it's infallible. Everything that God has said in his word cannot fail to come to pass. What we're talking about is that the the fact that every single word is exactly the word that God wants to be in the Bible. If that weren't true, 
Paul would not be able to build an argument on the fact that a particular word was singular rather than plural. Uh, in one argument he's drawing in the book of Galatians, he writes this in Galatians 3.16. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed, that is Christ. Notice that his whole argument is based on whether the word was singular or plural. The only way he could do that is if every word of Scripture was precisely what God wanted in his word. Now, why would God be so careful about the exact wording of the Scriptures if what was taught by those words was unimportant? I think you know that the Lord considers it to be important. Why did he take such care to make sure that the word that he inspired, that he breathed out through the apostles and prophets and so forth, that that word be communicated to us as, as accurately as it has been throughout the centuries? You know, the word of God, it's almost, I mean, the New Testament is almost a couple thousand years old now, and the Old Testament is certainly much older than that. And yet, as we consider all the, the manuscript copies of, of the, the Hebrew Old Testament and the, the Greek New Testament, there is so very little variation between those manuscripts. They are so accurate, especially when you compare it to other works that, uh, you know, secular works, uh, Greek works of poetry and so forth, as you can see them being transmitted, copied over and over again throughout the years, they just, they become corrupted, some 30, some 60 percent. God made sure that he communicated his word, that it was transmitted accurately throughout the centuries so that we would still have his word today. Now, why would the Lord do that if the truth that he was communicating to us was not important? And by the way, every word meaning not just the gospel, but everything that's connected to it. Now, it is true that the gospel is the, is the most important thing. If you get that wrong, then you won't make it to heaven. But that doesn't mean the rest of it is unimportant. Anywhere that we vary from God's truth, it's going to have three effects. It's going to, in some degree, dishonor the Lord it's going to, in some degree, hurt us. It's going to, in some degree, hurt others as well as we communicate our convictions with them. Let me give you a few examples of this. I mean, what if we're wrong concerning the Ten Commandments, whether or not they continue today? As many today actually believe that the Ten Commandments don't, especially in, in churches that are, are dispensational, but not just in dispensational churches, uh, they believe that in the New Covenant, that there's a new law. Christ, as the lawgiver, has given us a new law. It's not the, the same as the Ten Commandments. Well, how would that affect us if we believe that? Well, one thing we can know for certain, that if we take the road that some of them do, which is that our obedience is irrelevant, doesn't matter what we do, we're saved by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can just continue to sin and we're still going to make it to heaven. If that is our conclusion and we just throw the commandments away altogether, well, the Bible tells us that we're not saved. Because Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8 that the Spirit of God is actually working uh, his, his the, the, well, actually, he's, he's working the fulfillment of the law of God in us. And the way that he does that is this. The fulfillment of the law of God, as Paul tells us, is love. Love fulfills the commandments. The Spirit of God produces that love that is the evidence that we're true believers. We have to be walking in love in order to be saved. I mean, we're not, we don't do that to be saved, but that's the evidence that we are saved, which means the Spirit of God is fulfilling the law in us. That's what Paul says. In the New Covenant, the, the difference between the New Covenant and the Old Covenant is that the law was written on tablets of stone, and the commandment was given. You see these commandments? Obey them. In the New Covenant, the Lord takes those commandments and he writes them on our hearts. He does that by his Holy Spirit, giving us the desire to do those things, giving us love. So if we don't keep the commandments at all, then we are not true believers. Now, if we do keep those commandments by the Spirit of God, 
and we obey the greatest commandment, that, that actually the two commandments that Jesus said were the greatest, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, to love your neighbor as yourself, then we're not going to, be go, we're not going to go so far afield of what we are ought to be doing because we're going to be doing what God commands. But I think we have to recognize that if we reject the Ten Commandments and the explanations and applications of those commandments in the Old Testament, and we say they're irrelevant, we are not going to have as full an understanding of what it means to love God and what it means to love our neighbor as ourselves. We'll have some idea, and we'll do a lot of right things, but we're not going to have as clear an idea as we should, and to the extent that we're, we misunderstand, to that extent, we are going to dishonor the Lord, we're going to injure ourselves, and we're going to hurt others as we lead them to believe the same things that we hold. Now, many who hold this conviction that the commandments are no longer relevant also believe the fourth commandment, to uh, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, isn't binding in the new covenant, which to me is, is it's hard to understand exactly how you come to that conviction, especially when they, their argument usually is that the Lord Jesus repeated nine of the ten, but not that one. When I read the New Testament, it seems to me that he repeated that one more than any other and emphasized the fact that he was the Lord of the Sabbath and even told us how to observe it. It's not that he disregarded it. He spoke more about it than anything else. But now what happens if you reject that particular commandment? You don't think it's binding. Well, if you believe that and you practice that and it's really true that the commandment continues, then won't you be dishonoring the Lord if you do things on the Lord's day that you shouldn't be doing, if you work when you should be resting? If you're involved in, in thinking about the things of the world and playing the world's games when the Lord really wants you to be spending the day with Him to build that relationship you have with Him, to rest from the things of the world, to remind you that you're actually not of this world and just passing through this world and you're on your way to heaven, it's going to short circuit what the Lord intends for your good and it's going to, of course, dishonor Him if you're breaking his commandments and if you're encouraging others to do the same, it's going to hurt them as well. See, it, it matters what we believe. Now, what if you don't understand what God says in his word with regard to how you should worship the Lord? What if you believe like the Lutherans believe or as in broad evangelical churches believe that, that we can do uh, in our worship of the Lord Whatever we want to do, as long as God does not specifically forbid it in his word, well, what's going to happen if we do that, especially if we're wrong in that area, especially if what the reformers believed is right, which is that we only do those things that God actually commands in Scripture because he knows how he wants to be worshipped and he tells us how he wants to be worshipped. Well, if, if that is the case, then every week when we gather for worship, We'll be doing things, if we add things into the worship that God has not commanded, we'll be doing things that actually displease Him rather than pleasing Him. Uh, the heart isn't the only thing that matters in worship. What God wants to be done also matters. Again, the Old Testament example that the Reformers pointed to, for instance, God in the Old Testament gave a very specific uh, very specific commandments on how he wanted to be worshipped. And he, he specified not only who it is that was going to minister before him, and that would be Aaron's sons. You know, they're of the tribe of Levi, but it had to be Aaron and his sons in particular who were priests. Uh, what kinds of sacrifices and how they were supposed to divide those things up, you know, with the blood that was going to be spilled and what parts were going to be burned and which offerings could be kept and eaten and which ones need to be completely burned up but even down to the kind of incense that they would burn on the altar of incense before the Lord, all of those things were, were specified by the Lord. This is what I want you to do. This is what God said. Well, on one particular occasion, uh, Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu, for whatever reason, decided they would offer to the Lord something that was different than what he commanded. It was a different mixture of incense, and they put it in their fire pan, and they put it on the altar, and they burned it before the Lord. 
And the Bible says that God immediately struck them down. He killed them because of what they did. Because specifically they did something he had not commanded them to do. Leviticus chapter 10 verses 1 and 2. Now whatever you think of that, it should at least make you stop and, and, and consider whether God is pleased when we do things in worship that he has not commanded in scripture. I hope that we would at least stop and think about that. I mean, God knows what he wants, he tells us what he wants, and really what he gives us will keep us fairly occupied in worshiping him. So do we need really to look for other things to do? Now let me just give you one last example, and that has to do with the, uh, I'll tie this into the millennial positions that we've been looking at uh, recently. Does it really matter what you believe regarding the future? Does it really matter whether you believe you know, in the premillennial position or the amillennial position or the postmillennial position? I mean, it doesn't really have anything to do with your salvation, what, regardless of what you believe regarding the future. If you're trusting in Jesus Christ, you're, you're saved. So what, what does it matter? Well, it, it does matter. It, it, it does affect a few things in, in our lives. And again, everything that God says is going to affect us in one way or another. Uh, one area we saw is your, uh, your level of optimism. You know, is, is something good going to happen in the future or something bad? I mean, are things going to get worse or are things going to get better before the Lord Jesus Christ comes? You know, it's amazing that we all have the same Bible, we all read the same Bible, and we, we come away with different views. On, on what that is. And again, we don't want to condemn one another for our views. I just want to say that it will make a difference what we believe. It will make a difference in, in what happens. Optimism is certainly one thing. Now, what you believe regarding what God has said is going to happen in the future is going to affect your prayers, what you're praying for, what you're expecting to see. Now, Jesus told his disciples Go and make disciples of all the nations. But certain views of the future don't see that that's actually going to take place. So the question is, should we pray for that? Should we pray that all the nations would be discipled? Should we pray what we seem to see in the Old Testament as far as the prediction of the future that all the nations are actually going to submit to his law? Should we pray for that if we don't believe that's what's going to happen? If we don't believe that that's what God's actually promised? Should we pray that God's blessings advance in the world if he hasn't really told us that's what he's intending on doing? Should you expect that God is going to answer a prayer like that? Can you actually pray that in faith? Now again, I'm just showing you the difference that it makes. The only way that you can pray a prayer of faith and know that God hears you and that he's going to answer you is if you know that he has promised that that's actually going to take place. Now, how can you pray a prayer of faith? And by the way, if you pray a prayer that isn't a prayer of faith, you really can't have the expectation that God's going to hear you and answer you because you don't believe it's going to happen. Uh, you know, Jesus was able, to, in some instances, was not able to do the miracles that he might otherwise have done because of the littleness of their faith. They did not believe, and if they didn't believe, they couldn't receive. The Lord tells us that if we are to receive, he tells us through James, if we pray and yet we doubt, we shouldn't expect to receive anything. So we have to pray a prayer of faith if we're going to see those things actually take place. Now, if you don't believe that God has promised that those things are going to happen, you can't pray a prayer of faith. Again, that's just one of the ways that it's going to affect us. But if you believe that he has promised that, then that's one promise you can take hold of in prayer and you can wrestle with him in prayer and you can know that you're heard and you can know he's going to answer it. Again, um, another example of how this affects us is the kind of expectation that we're going to have as we go out and, and seek to share the gospel with other people. I tend to think that as the apostles went out, they had a certain expectation that God was going to do some great things. Now, certainly there was a great deal of persecution that came with it, too. The Bible says that that's going to happen, particularly in the present day when things look so dark and gloomy. But they also had the expectation that God was going to be there with them, that God was going to work with them, that Christ was going to gather his sheep 
to himself through their message. And just the level of expectation that they have, perhaps we might be reading into it, but it looked to me like they had a great expectation of what God was going to do. And the question is, can we have that same level of expectation that they had? Well, if, post, you know, if the idea that things are going to get better in the future is true, then we can. But if things are just going to get worse, we can. If they're just going to stay the same, we can't. It's going to affect our expectations of what we can hope to see. And again, that has to do with faith and what actually we are going to see happen because what we're going to see happen is going to be somewhat determined on what we believe and what we're willing to believe God for. Sometimes I think we think, and I'm sure we do think this way, that God's going to do what God's going to do regardless of what we do, regardless of what we pray, regardless of what we think. And in some areas, that's certainly true. But it's also true that in many cases that what we are able to apprehend by faith is what we will actually see take place. If we're not seeing certain things happen, perhaps it's because we're not trusting God as we should. So that's an area that we should examine our lives in. But again, if God has promised that these things are going to take place, but we don't see it in that way, then, then we, we're not going to have the kind of boldness, the kind of faith, the kind of expectancy that we might otherwise have, perhaps it even wants us to have, if, in fact, the Lord is going to do these things. So it is important what we believe. Every truth that God gives to us makes a difference in one area or another. It makes a difference, of course, in, in what we believe and how we're going to pray and how we're going to live and what we're going to expect to see, which, it, which is why it's important that as, as much as we possibly can, we understand and believe and embrace what God has revealed in his word. And I'm sure that we all seek to do that, but this is just a reminder to do the very best that we can. Because in every area where we're off of what God has actually said, what he actually wants us to do, what he's actually promised he's going to do, is going to offend him in some way, although again, God is thankfully very gracious. It's going to, to hurt us in some way, and it is going to hurt others. Now, having said that, I just want to remind you of one last thing. Nobody has all the truth. All of us are wrong in one area or another. All of us believe things and do things that are offensive to God. I'm not saying that to excuse us, but none of us have arrived. None of us have that perfect truth, and certainly none of us live in a way that is completely pleasing to the Lord. Jesus is the only one who's ever done it. The second thing is that not all truth is equally as important. I hope you see that too. Doesn't mean you're going to miss heaven if you get you know, your, your view of the future wrong. Obviously not. Uh, God is, is gracious. God is merciful. He has made the, the gospel so plain that, well, as, as it's been said in the past, anyone with average intelligence can understand it. Even a child can understand it. We need to be thankful that God has made the most important things uh, simple so that we can. So no one has all the truth. Not all the truth is equally important. Even in those areas where we, we do misunderstand what God says, God is merciful. He's not going to cast us away because we don't believe things as we should or because we do some things that are dishonoring to him. He knows our weakness. He knows that we are ignorant to some degree. He knows that we are but dust. He is gracious and he is merciful. But the thing I wanted to point out is that God's truth is very precious. So make sure that you hold on to what you have of that truth. Don't compromise. Don't consider it unimportant. There are those who say, well, you know what, I get the, I get the main things, in, in, you know, I get the, those main truths that are necessary for my salvation. I got those right, so it doesn't really matter what I believe regarding the other things. I'm not even going to bother with those. No, it, it does matter. It matters a great deal as far as how you're going to live, as far as how you're going to pray, as far as honoring God, as far as helping other people. All these things do make a difference, but especially the gospel. So let's make sure, by God's grace, that we get it as accurately as we possibly can, especially the gospel, but every area. And let's also remember in Christian love 
that you know, this is one of those uh, areas where, yes, the Lord calls us to hold fast the truth and, and to believe the truth. And because of that, sometimes it can be difficult when we talk to people who don't believe the same way we do on something. Let's remember that uh, the Lord has not given to, to each of us uh, the same light that he has. And, and let's not forget, we may be wrong. Let's remember to love one another, even though we may disagree on exactly what it is that God says. We all agree that truth is important, but we may not all agree on what that truth is. Let's make sure that we still love one another, even if we disagree. And by God's grace, iron sharpening iron, try to bring one another to the positions that we believe are true in love and gentleness and in a, you know, a great number of conversations, actually. Uh, that's a very good thing. It helps to build us all up in Christ. Well, may the Lord help us uh, to do what he has called us to do and to hold on to those truths. Uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to help us do that.